Hello, everyone. Um, so this is going to be a recorded interview conversation about intimacy coordination and intimacy direction with Emily Sucher. Uh, but my name is Emily Schmidt, and I am the Education Programs Manager here at the National Theatre Foundation. And so this is happening as a part of our Teens Behind the Scenes program. So while this conversation is you know, geared towards students that might be interested in prospective careers in the performing arts, it's also just, I think, a wonderful opportunity to hear about intimacy coordination for anyone that might uh, come across our Teens Behind the Scenes web series. So I'm really excited to go ahead and uh, begin our conversation here. So. Um, Emily Sucher is a multidisciplinary theater artist and educator. They are a Helen Hayes Award nominated intimacy director, and they have nearly 30 intimacy choreography and consultation credits in the regional DMV theater, um, as well as several short films and extensive training from organizations, including intimacy directors and coordinators, uh, theatrical intimacy education, the National Society of Intimacy Professionals and Intimacy Coordinators of Color. Emily completed level three of IDC's certification program and is a proud member of the organization's very first cohort of intimacy directors. So also a performer, they are equally passionate about acting and are an equity membership candidate. So Emily, I wanted to just open the floor up to you, so that's your bio, but if there's anything else you wanted to add to introduce yourself. Um, I think that covers it. Uh, yeah, I'm good to go. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, I think one of the first uh, questions I had for you is you have quite the eclectic theater background. Um, I think like everything from Shakespeare to improv. Um, and so I just wanted to know a little bit more about your journey um, in the performing arts, how you came to this career field. Uh, and then specifically sort of how that journey led you to intimacy coordination. Yeah, so it's a bit of a long story because <laughs> I think that I found intimacy direction through multiple different angles. I was, I guess, brought there from several different pathways that converged and it made it pretty clear to me that this is something I should be doing. Um, also, just to clear up at the beginning, just some vocabulary to get everybody on the same page. Um, so when I say intimacy direction, that's specifically for theater and live performance. And intimacy coordination is used for uh, TV and film. So just to it, it gets confusing and <laughs> it depends a lot on what term a lot of people are used to hearing. And there have been, I think, more widespread article sharing about the film and TV world. So sometimes people default to coordinator. And a lot of that comes from a contract language. So intimacy coordination was an extension of stunt coordinator contracts when it first began. I, don't, I can't speak too logistically to all of the legal and contract um, decisions that went into those titles, but that's how they're used. So, yeah, so, so the bulk of my experience and my expertise is in intimacy direction, so for the stage. Um, and I've got Yeah, thank you for that yeah. clarification, because I was wondering, too, I hear both of those words thrown yeah. around. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So there, you know, there's a lot of overlap. It's a lot of similar skill sets, but that's where the expertise is different. Um, so for me, where the most of my experience, even apart from intimacy work, um, has been in theater and live performance. And I, uh, I I've, always been passionate about theater and I studied theater arts in school and in addition to uh, being an actor I would dabble a little bit in directing so I did take some directing courses in college um, and I, I really enjoyed it I was really drawn to bringing out um performances and other people and helping tell a clear story and putting together a an evocative stage picture. So that's, I think, what drew me to the choreography um, side of things. Um, and 
I also found that as an intimacy uh, director and choreographer from that side of things, it appeals to the things that I really loved about directing and felt very confident in, in directing, but without needing to deal with as many of the top of the trees responsibilities that directors have to do. So directors, not only are they, you know, working with actors and helping them helping shape their performances, but they also have to manage all of the other design departments and come up with calls about lights and props and all of that. And that level of management isn't as much my strength. So while I was, you know, I would occasionally, so after being a student and working as a, you know, theater professional, I would sometimes direct staged readings here and there or, you know, short plays, but I didn't really want to pursue the level of directing a full stage show, but I really liked the skill that goes into it. Meanwhile, um, as a theater professional, you also usually need a day job or assortment of day jobs. So I had been working in a very popular uh, stage job for actors in the area, just working as a standardized patient, where you work with medical schools and portray a patient for uh, medical training um, so that students can practice working with a human being, both with physical exams and with um, how to communicate with a lay person when you know, either delivering bad news or um, giving a complicated diagnosis and making sure that they aren't overly technical in their language. So bringing the human side to medicine. And it's a way for actors to act and portray different characters, but also it, it's a really great way to feel like you're paying things forward in the medical field. So helping doctors or future doctors remember to treat people like human beings while they're and in this early stage of their uh, education, balancing a lot of, of learning. Um, and there are a lot of medical schools in the DC area, especially bringing in Baltimore and the surrounding areas. So it's pretty lucrative for performers to build something up and still have a flexible schedule. And within um, many of these standardized patient departments, there is an opportunity to uh, coach students in their physical exam technique. So I became a physical exam teaching associate um, to help students work on their technical skills as well. And that's sort of, I look at it kind of like being a translator of, we get trained in the clinical material so that we can teach students accurate technique, but we're also usually teaching them on ourselves. So we're also reminding them that like, all right, so when you are uh, pressing on the abdomen to feel for a mass, also maybe give them a warning before, don't press as hard as you can right away. Um, or, you know, when checking their thyroid on the back of the neck, don't sneak up from behind and do that. <laughs> so it's about, you know, it's um, not sacrificing accuracy for humanity, but reminding them that they should keep both things in mind. And just because of need at the time, I actually, uh, before I started teaching students how to listen to heart and lungs and things like that, I uh, first became trained in how to teach gynecologic exams. So teaching uh, breast and pelvic exams on myself to medical students and teaching them how to perform that on me. And due to that, I was kind of developing my own um, consent education curriculum, um, both with what we were teaching the students on how to do, but also specifically things that I found were important um, as I began teaching more and more groups of students. So I would learn on the job, like, okay, uh, it's important to be aware of your language so that even when 
through the best of intentions, students might, you know, in a breast exam say like, all right, looks beautiful. You might not want to say it in that context <laughs> because it, it might carry meaning that you don't intend. So as I was doing both things, like working as a theater artist and doing this work in medical schools, I learned about intimacy direction and I saw kind of all those things come together of being able to help tell stories, help actors feel safe, help productions feel confident and get be specific in our storytelling. But also I had this other part of the work that I do, which is not so with uh, with medical students where I was saying to not sacrifice clinical accuracy for the humanity involved, it works the same way in theater. We don't have to sacrifice evocative storytelling and going deep for the safety and the humanity of the performers telling it. Wow, yeah, that kind of hit on, um, you know, because I knew you had this a varied background, was sort of um, something I was wondering is how the your experiences um, as a patient educator, or not patient, as a, um, what do yeah, you call it? A, yeah, so um, it's standardized a, patient. A, yeah, so the standardized patient is the role playing of playing mm. a patient, and then being an, a clinical skills educator, that's it's titled differently with different schools, but it's most often referred to as a physical exam teaching associate or PETA or okay. the specialization with the gynecologic exams is a GUDA or generally urinary teaching associate. Okay. So it depends. And like I said, very long story because I was sort of brought in from multiple directions. Yeah. So I was sort of wondering how your experience um, in the medical field kind of impacts how you approach things as an intimacy director. But I think you kind of touched on that. Um, yeah, I, 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 mean, I find that interesting that not wanting to sacrifice, you know, art, but, m you know, maintaining the safety specificity of language, treating people like humans. Yeah, well, I think that having come from that background and as I began, as people started coming out with more and more horror stories mm -hmm. from theater where they were taught that their boundaries don't matter or that in order to be an easy to work with actor that you shouldn't have boundaries, mm -hmm. that people are entitled to you in that way. It was reflecting the work that I would teach on a regular basis to medical students. And it's they're they're not mutually exclusive, right? If there's a middle ground of saying that, you know, just because you're a doctor doesn't mean that the person in front of you stops being a human being. And it doesn't mean that you stop being a human being who, you know, doesn't know everything. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so could you talk a little bit about... Um, how, so the kinds of performances or, or aspects of a performance that might require an intimacy director. And then does that process, do actors request that intimacy directors are brought on or does it come from the stage director or is it a bit of both? Yeah, so at this stage, while intimacy direction is still a fairly new art form and is still pretty new in the cultural consciousness and in the industry, uh, we're being brought on in different ways. The, the hope is that it's sort of a standard expectation in most productions that require one. So, you know, just like you would have a costume designer having an intimacy director included without needing to make special requests would, you know, is the hope going forward, but it is still new. So it makes sense that it requires that extra thought right now. So I've been brought on uh, productions 
through a bunch of different ways. And sometimes it's the theater itself on the administrative end saying, this is something that we need. And I get reached out through there. Uh, sometimes I hear it is because an actor requested to have an intimacy director involved in the process. And that's where the chain of communication begins. Sometimes the director um, says so. And so right now it depends on I think the experience of the decision makers involved on um, whether they were aware of it beforehand or it took somebody else making a request. Ideally, it's not because they get into rehearsals and then a problem comes up and then it's, oh, we needed somebody before and then you come on late and then it becomes about damage control. Um, so ideally, it's not that, but at this stage, sometimes it is. Um, with the other part of your question about knowing whether a piece does require one, um, that also will sometimes depend. Sometimes it's pretty straightforward. Like if there is nudity or simulated sex involved, yes, you should have an intimacy director. Um, with uh, a kiss or um, other forms of intimacy, um, I would say that it's ideal that you have an intimacy director. It should, you know, it'll most likely help your process, um, both with the, uh, you know, safety involved, because we don't know what everyone's boundaries necessarily are. And, you know, it's uh, like with the fight director's analogy, if you say to just slap somebody, they probably won't get seriously injured, but they could. <laughs> and do you really want to take that risk? So same thing with that. It's, um, you know, it's not only will it be safer, but you can also then you have somebody who's there to help the storytelling go to deeper levels than the director usually has time or the expertise to devote to that. So, I mean, any intimacy. I've also, I've helped with familial intimacy, um, just making sure that how, how people physically interact with each other is reading. I know that um, some other intimacy directors have also been brought on for um, just really loaded emotional content. Um, I haven't done this personally, but a colleague of mine was uh, telling a story about how they helped stage a panic attack. So things like that, that are to help pe people be emotionally safe and be truthful to the story so that everybody feels confident with it going forward. Um, some of it is going to depend on the piece and the, the company involved, what other resources they have and how this person can help serve them. Do you collaborate with the stage director as a part of that process? Because I know stage directors have, you know, their own ideas about like how the story should be told um, and maybe some of the blocking or choreography mm -hmm. that they've already established on the piece. Um, so is that, do you work with the director to create that or is it, um, you know, more like oh. they, they come, I imagine it would depend on the director too, right? Sometimes yeah. Like with a vision. yeah, yeah. So definitely the way that that looks is going to depend on the director and their style and their expertise and everything. But um, yeah, it should absolutely be a collaborative process. Um, so one thing that I think is really important that I like to tell directors at the beginning that we're not there to take over their vision. We're not there even really to decide what that vision is. That still really belongs to the director. We're there to help support the process of bringing that vision to life, of reflecting back what we see physically. So sometimes that'll be all right, um, I'm seeing these two actors doing this. Um, this looks like, okay, so once I um, saw two actors uh, positioned in a way um, that looked 
like a couple. It was reading as a couple and they were supposed to be brother and sister. It was not my impression that that was the story that the director was going for. But instead of, you know, I'm not going to go and say, well, that's wrong. I'm going to say, here's what I'm seeing when um, she's putting her hand on his knee like this. It's reading to me in this way. Is that what you were going for? Oh, okay, if it's not, can I offer this? So, um, yeah, I'm not there to, and sometimes I say, here's what I'm seeing. Is that correct? And they'll say, yes, that is what we were going for in a, in a different scenario. And that is valid and up to them. So th I might reflect back as a fresh pair of eyes. Um, this is the story that I'm seeing here's where I might be confused and, or here's where it's not reading in the way that you're intending. So then we can work together to help support that vision better. Um, but I'm not there to overtake or dictate in any way. I also want to honor the character choices that the actors bring forward. It's not taking away all of the innovation from them either. So I'm going to first begin by asking them like, well, what would your character do? Okay, let's stage that in a way that reads um, to the audience because you can't necessarily see what you look like while performing. Um, let's make sure that it's comfortable within all of the performers boundaries and let's make sure that it's sustainable and repeatable because also a difference between theater and film is that with theater you usually are going to need to perform this choreography over and over again so it needs to be consistent um it needs to be sustainable yeah did that did that answer your question? I know it's going in a lot of different directions here. <laughs> no, definitely. I mean, I could see how that would be enormously helpful to both directors and actors. Um, yeah, I. it's always helpful to have a second set of eyes, too, to be like, oh, my artistic vision is not reading how I wanted it to. Yeah, <laughs> or and not sometimes, that yeah, and helpful. sometimes that's on a story level, and sometimes it's more technical, like, you know, sight lines. So maybe, oh, the people on audience left, um, they're seeing this, but audience right is not getting the story at all. So uh, sometimes it's those tweaks and adjustments and also depending on the director's background and how involved they want to be, it can be a lot more uh, staging everything step by step. Sometimes it's about setting like more anchor points, like, okay, we need to get here, here and here. How we do it can be a little bit more loose, depending on all of those things, depending on the actor's comfort, depending on how physically demanding it is. So the how specifically that looks like uh, depends on the piece, depends on the people involved. And I know, um, I mean, you mentioned that this is kind of an up and coming field. Um, and so uh, there's like a lot of education that's going on around it and around, you know, what mm -hmm. it is specifically yeah. that you do and how it could be so beneficial to productions to to have intimacy coordinator or intimacy directors um, involved. And so I'm wondering um, what some of maybe the joys and challenges of working in in a field that is um, evolving have been for you. Yeah, it's um, it's really exciting to see how quickly it has grown in the you know, five to six years since I've begun studying. Um, and also, you know, acknowledging that even though it's new in, under this title and in this codified way, that, you know, people have been staging intimacy for years. So it's not about taking away the work that people have done or not honoring that. But it's about not leaving that up to chance because th th a lot of people, I'm sure, have had wonderful, positive experiences, but a lot of that was left up to luck because a scene partner was really supportive and respectful and or because a director gave more space than was usually expected at, or someone else, maybe a 
a wardrobe person was able to step in and make sure somebody felt confident. So people have been helping in different ways, but because there was no you know, official title, because there was no um, you know, training specifically in this, a lot of that was left up to chance. And so now um, having people actively look out for that, um, it's really, really gratifying when um, introducing somebody to this and seeing them realize that they deserved better in a time where they have been treated poorly and for them to know that they can ask for things going forward and that doesn't make them a difficult or disposable colleague. Um, so that's really inspiring to see. Um, it can, though, be challenging when people want to dig their heels in and, you know, insist that because they've never had something that, that that's not worth their time. And yeah, that, that can be pretty discouraging because we, you know, people, people evolve. It's not about blaming people for not doing something in the past when they didn't know it was an option, but not opening your mind now is just, you know, it's counterproductive because when you know better, you should try to do better. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, back in, uh, I'll, I'll age myself, but um, in 2014, when I was in high school, we were doing student directed productions and the senior in high school, it was um, a scene from almost Maine and had just like a, mm -hmm. you know, a simulated kiss in it. And he was like, just go for it. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think it's, it's nice that there is um, some evolution in this field that, you know, um, so I'm wondering, actually, if, if you have maybe advice for up and coming or newer actors um, that maybe, maybe may not be aware that this is a resource um, that's out there for them or just how how as an actor and you could speak to your experiences as an, as an actor as well. You go about establishing some of those boundaries for yourself, because when you're new, you, you might not know. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Some of that is not knowing what you can and can't do because there still is you know, so much work that needs to be done. It is still just a new idea to be able to speak up for yourself in this way. Um, but the, the more communication that occurs. So first, I, I think knowing in yourself that you are entitled to your boundaries, you, um, one's a Chelsea Pace quote from Theatrical Intimacy Education, but your boundaries are perfect exactly where they are. You do not need to force yourself to overcome something that won't make you a better artist. That's not something that's on the line. You don't need to suffer for that. So knowing, first of all, that that's not the case, that you can still challenge yourself without compromising your integrity or putting yourself in danger and just communicating with your colleagues, with your scene partners, with your director. Um, also knowing that you are welcome to make suggestions. So if it, um, you know, if a boundary is, uh, no, I don't want somebody to touch my neck, you can also offer like um, that you can touch my shoulder. So you can still progress with the scene and offer other options and you're still being a creative um, scene partner. You're still contributing. Um, so knowing that communicating for yourself doesn't take away from what you have to offer, that's not shutting things down. Um, I think that's the first step knowing that you can also request an intimacy director. Like I said, I've gotten jobs that way from actors making those requests. And it is something now that people are aware of. So if they haven't done it for you, 
you might just be introducing that theater or that group to something that then they'll invest in and be grateful for in the future. And yeah, also knowing that as it is a newer art form that um, people as in the intimacy directors, how we're being trained is also evolving and that might take different amounts of time with different people. So with it being a new thing, I also know that um, because like you said, um, sometimes your direction in the past would just be, all right, go for it. Go for it doesn't take a lot of time. So <laughs> devoting any amount of additional time to intimacy in the rehearsal process is going to be an adjustment just for schedules. Um, that was all, I think that was also something that some early in early productions, um, taking longer than people would expect would sometimes get them impatient. Um, and you know, it's a two way thing. I've also learned to be more efficient with my time, <laughs> but it's going to take longer than just go for it. So I think being prepared to devote some extra time is also important. Yeah, definitely. That is really good advice. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about, I mean, I know you don't have as much experience with intimacy coordination, um, but how, how things differ from a film perspective, I know you said you've done a couple of short films mm -hmm. um, versus a, a live staged performance. Sure. So the elements that are the same and again, only speaking to my experience. So I haven't worked on a big set. So when you're thinking about things like, you know, HBO shows or whatnot, that's going to be different from my experience. Um, but so a lot of it is time. So you don't have the rehearsal, the extended rehearsal period that theater um, affords you. So it moves a lot faster, but also a lot of those conversations take place beforehand um, in contract negotiations. So every actor, especially if nudity is involved, is going to have a contract called a rider and that's going to you know state out what they will and what they will not do and there's a lot of detail that goes into that so um, the intimacy coordinator will be involved in conversations um, with what goes in the actor's rider and what the director is asking for so if the director is asking for one thing and that contradict something in the actor's writer, making sure that those things aren't at odds. That shouldn't be a surprise on filming day. Um, the intimacy coordinator is also going between, and this is similar to theater as well, but a lot of it's done. The process is different because you're doing a lot of it not at rehearsals or production meetings, but in some of these other phone calls. Um, between wardrobe, um, things like that, because sometimes a an actor's writer might specify, yes, they're willing to show this, but only from this angle or only from this type of light or something like that. So a lot more contract work is involved in intimacy coordination, a lot less rehearsal time. Um, and in terms of the staging and choreography aspect of it, um, the same principles are involved of making sure that everybody's safe, making sure that the story is clear, um, but you have a different set of tools before you with film because well, one thing you can do in film that you can't do in theater is you can cut. <laughs> so you can do a close up on someone's face and then cut to a hand reacting and things like that to communicate the story that you can't do in a theater space. But also you uh, from far away with theater, you can hide things with angles that 
you can't going up that close um, with a camera. Um, you can also usually suspend reality differently in the theater space, even if you can't cut to show passage of time. People also don't process time differently on stage because you can say it's two years later on stage and we can accept that. Um, so you still have the same storytelling priority, but you're using a different set of tools, if that helps. Yeah, I think that, no, that makes a lot of sense. And it ties to just um, like non-intimate scenes as well. Acting mm -hmm. for stage on camera or acting for stage is very different than acting on camera. Yeah, um, so things like breath, like mm -hmm. that'll read differently. Like, you know, a small intake will might carry on film and you might need to amplify that on stage depending on the space that you're in. Yeah, yeah makes a lot of sense. Um, well, I think one last question I, I have for you um, is just what, um, I, I know there's kind of this myth of a, of a starving artist out there. Um, and so I know you just have such a, a wide variety of experiences. So I'm wondering what advice you might give to um, high school students or just like emerging career professionals that are trying to figure out um, how to how to be a freelance artist and performer. Sure. Um, so, uh, I mean, it is hard. Um, I think that it's really important to know yourself really well and know what works for you um, because the different schedules, so things like if you need a more regular schedule for you to just function at your best, um, Sometimes the freelancing can be really erratic. And for me, I like variety. I, you know, I, I struggle more when um, I, I'm bored. <laughs> so when I, when things are too much the same every day, I think that's harder for me to be as successful as at the things that I'm doing. But I also have to, um, you know, keep track on, on myself that I'm not overdoing it. So I think you have to know what works best for you, where you can feel most successful and most creative and happiest and confident that you're doing your best work, what type of schedule <laughs> makes sense for that. Um, and then also know, know your limits. So I guess knowledge of your boundaries also extends to just how you schedule out your life. Um, but also I think that one thing that I was, I wasn't really aware of being able to freelance in this way when I was a student, because I just knew that, you know, people went to work. I didn't see that <laughs> variety models for me. That wasn't really <laughs> explained to me as an option. So yeah, I, I, knowing that there are a lot of different things available um, and that you can be creative with what you do, that there are a lot more options out there than you think and um, connect with people who you think are interesting and are doing things you would like to do and build community in that way. Because I think that's that's how I found what what I'm doing now. And those are things that I didn't know were options for me when I was a student. So just keep your mind open. Yeah, definitely. Lots of, lots of gems there for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I guess I lied. Um, my last question yeah. is just, um, I just wanted to uplift. You just got a Helen Hayes nomination. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I just, um, what, uh, are there any projects you're working on right now or, um, you know, other, you know, theater things in the in the district that you just want to uplift and share with people? Yeah, um, so that was a big surprise for me, um, but it's really exciting because it's, you know, not just for me, but I wasn't aware that uh, Theater Washington and Helen Hayes were as 
aware of intimacy direction as an art form in that way. And I was also just to shout out New Sass Productions and our um, show last May, June, To Fall in Love by Jennifer Lane. Um, it was a really special piece and it was one that I felt very attached to as a, a really challenging piece for an intimacy director, but one that just uh, felt really beautiful and successful with everyone involved. So I'm really proud that that was recognized. Um, currently, I am uh, performing in my first full show as an actor since before COVID. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it was, it's really a special to be back. And um, it's also another great company of people. I'm in 46 plays for America's First Ladies at Next Stop Theater Company. Um, and it's a piece by the neo-futurists. It's very fun. It's political. It is um, like pretty much what it sounds like. It is 46 short plays. And each of those plays might be a song, a dance, a sketch, something, um, one for each first lady in US history. So it's a great time. Um, and we run through February 19th. I am in rehearsals currently um, for my next uh, show as an actor. It's a deconstructed Julius Caesar with WSC Avant Bard. Um, and that is also, that is in Arlington, Virginia. And I'm about to start um, rehearsals. I'm just going to double check the title of this because I don't want to say it wrong. <laughs> But I'm going to be intimacy directing for Sometimes the Rain, Sometimes the Sea with a Rorschach Theater in D.C. Wow, so lots of exciting projects going on coming up. <laughs> yeah, it's a busy time, which is good. Mm -hmm. Well, once again, I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. And um, I think this is lots of valuable information to share with our students. So. Yeah, I really hope they get something from it. I know sometimes it feels like a simple question is gets like this sprawling answer, but, you know, it, it <laughs> goes to a lot of places, I think. Definitely. No, there's a podcast I listen to and her thing is she's like, ask smart people simple questions. So thank you for being my smart person today. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs>